Welcome to the Gottesdienst Crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the Church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Godestine's Crowd. This is Jason Broughton, your host. Today we have with us Mike Grevy. He is the pastor of Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Golden, Illinois. Welcome back, Mike. Jason, it's great to be with you again. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, it's been since COVID when we were going <laughs> through all of the, um, the, the passages about suffering and pestilences and things like that. That's right. Uh, that was that was a very good thing to do, and that was a very uh, fruitful thing to be doing. I think, uh, although if I'm uh, being honest, I admit that it's a little bit nicer to be with you this time than last time <laughs> yeah. in that regard, but <laughs> a little more pleasant anyway. Yeah, so. true, true. Well, today we're going to be looking at the gospel reading for the eleventh Sunday after Trinity. It is from Luke chapter eighteen, verses nine to fourteen. And I will go ahead and read that from the English Standard Version, and then we'll chat. Sounds great. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. All right, so context-wise, uh, what is, if any, context that kind of helps us understand the broader, perhaps, meaning or understanding of what uh, Jesus is teaching or addressing uh, to those who trusted in themselves? Yeah, sure. Well, if you go back... Um you know, if we go back a few chapters to Luke 14, for example, you have uh, when Jesus went into a house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. And there's this man with dropsy that's there. And mm -hmm. then Jesus says to the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they don't say anything. And so then um, he goes on to speak a parable to those who were invited uh, noting how they chose the best places. And one of the things that he says is uh, repeated in Luke 18 here. So mm. uh, at the end of Luke 18, the, the text you just read, verse 14, at the end, Jesus says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And he says the same thing in Luke 14, verse 11, when he's mm -hmm. talking about taking the lowly place. He says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then that leads into the parable of the Great Supper after that, mm -hmm. when he's speaking of eating bread in the kingdom of God and uh, talks about the man who gave a great supper and invited many. And uh, he tells them to come for everything's ready, but then they make their excuses uh, mm -hmm. of various kinds. And so that whole section has to do with humility and seeing ourselves rightly in the eyes of God. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is uh, humility is not self-degradation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not putting oneself down uh, because that's not honorable to God either, but it is seeing oneself rightly in the eyes of God, which first mm -hmm. and foremost means seeing oneself as a sinner and in need of mercy. Yeah. And so that's really the, that's, you know, part of this overall context here, this broader context uh, at which Jesus is getting at. Um, because then after that, he goes into, you've got the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin and the prodigal son, which all have to do about 
people being brought into the kingdom of God, those who were lost in sin being brought in and rescued. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that leads into uh, the parable of the unjust steward, which we just had a couple weeks ago here. Mm -hmm. Um, And the teaching there gets a little more directed to, it's really directed toward the disciples there. It's directed to the Christian as to Mm -hmm. what we should be doing with our man and how we should be using it to the glory of God and for the benefit of our neighbor. Mm -hmm. Um, and that we can't ultimately serve two masters. We can't serve God and man. We've got to rightly, we need to rightly order these things, not balance them, but rightly order them yeah. uh, in the kingdom of God. Um, and then you have the, you know, you have the rich man and Lazarus there as well, which of course, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> the rich man, there's nothing redeeming in the rich man at all in that, in that parable in chapter 16. Uh, the, Lazarus is poor and beggarly, but he is, uh, but he has humility and he recognizes the one whom he trusts. He knows the one whom he trusts and he is saved because of his faith. He's justified because he has the faith of Abraham, Mm -hmm. uh, whose son he is. And uh, so he goes to eternal life and the rich man goes to Hades. Uh, then you have also uh, the 10 lepers uh, in chapter 17, where you have all 10 being healed of their leprosy, but you have just one of them returning, and that was a foreigner. He was a Samaritan, and he came back and worshiped at the feet of Jesus and shows mm-hmm. what really what faith looks like uh, to the Lord, uh, that it's not just lip service and it's not just actions. But it's the whole body. It's the heart, the mind, the soul, and the body uh, together coming and glorifying God and falling down at the feet of Jesus and giving him thanks. Again, that's a demonstration of humility there uh, by the one leper who returned. Um, and then I would say also uh, at the beginning of Luke 18, right, the very first parable, the parable of the persistent widow, um, it, it says he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And I think there's a connection there that can be made and should be made to praying and how what we see, the two different kinds of prayers that we then see in the text that you just read. Mm, The prayer of the Pharisee and the prayer of the tax collector are entirely different. They're totally contrasted with one another. Um, And so, uh, so anyway, I think that's kind of, you know, gives us a broad picture that these these chapters are dealing with, I think, what humility looks like in the eyes of God and what it should look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, um, you know, the reality of the condemnation that comes upon those who do trust in themselves that they're righteous and despise yeah. others. Yeah, it seems like there's a kind of a thread. So you mentioned that uh, humility is not self-degradation, but then the flip side, it would be that it's also not self-exaltation, right? Um, oh, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, but rather, humility is, I think you put it as recognizing kind of where you stand in relation to to God himself. And, and that can seem um, to someone who is speaking confidently about what God has actually said, that can seem as though He's not humble, but that is that is being humble, right? When you are clinging to what the the Word of God says, and you say, "Well, thus says the Lord," matter of factly, that's not being, um, you know, that's not exalting yourself. That's exalting the Lord, and you are confident in that. Absolutely, yeah, and that sometimes does get uh, chastised by people as such, you know, as being kind of prideful a, a self-exaltation and a pridefulness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's, it's uh, on the one hand, it's easy to do that, but if you, you have to, and that's why we have to listen to people's words, what they're saying. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when they are clinging to the word of God, like this tax collector was, I mean, because he did see himself rightly and because he was exercising humility, then he actually was exalted because of that. That's that's precisely the point, that because he did see himself rightly, that turned out for his exaltation. Uh, and it wasn't a self-exaltation. He was exalted by God himself, really. 
Yeah. So you've you've kind of got that working out. Um, the Pharisee holds up himself before God, and the tax collector holds up God and and who he is and his sacrifice in his prayer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely right. Okay. Yeah. So we're dealing with basically from Luke 14 forward, humility, repentance, clinging to the word of God before all other things, and seeing yourself in, in the proper relationship to who God is and who you are. Yes, I would say so. Yeah, that's a good okay. summary. Yes. All right. So uh, any translation issues? I mean, I've got a couple that you're probably going to mention, so I'll let you just mention them. I do think that, uh, it, not that it's a wrong translation necessarily, but when the, um, when the tax collector says, uh, God be merciful to me, a sinner, um, the, the root word there in, in verse 13 comes from the word that is translated a couple of their places, uh, 1 John 2, uh, verse 2. The word for what? Uh, the word, I'm sorry. Yeah, the word for um, uh, the word for merciful translated as prof- propitiation. Yeah, yeah, propitiation. So, in First John two, verse two, you have uh, that, and He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And then in chapter four of again of First John, this is chapter four, verse ten. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So I don't, again, I'm not, I don't think it's a wrong translation, but you could translate that as God be propitiated to me Mm -hmm. or, you know, be my propitiation. That is the propitiation has to do with, um, it is the, it's an offering that is made to appease or satisfy an angry or offended party. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's the offering to appease. God is God the Father is the angry party and the offended party, and the offering and the satisfaction is given by Jesus by yeah. His death on the cross. So this so, is this, this is yeah. is it not also the root or or of the same semantic domain that goes along with the term for the mercy seat? Yes, right. The yeah, term so this for is the, mercy the place. Seat. This is the place of atonement. Yes, right. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant from the Old Testament had a mercy seat. It was made with a mercy seat. And, um, you know, the Holy One of Israel uh, is the mercy seat. And the Ark of the Covenant, you know, if you trace through the Old Testament and if you read through these Old Testament narratives, you can see the, the importance of the presence of God in connection with where the Ark of the Covenant is. Mm-hmm. The Ark of the Covenant, where the Ark of the Covenant is, there also is the presence of God. And the mercy seat, uh, God is the one who sits in the mercy seat uh, mm-hmm. for the purpose of giving mercy and having mercy on those who are his people, whom he brought out of uh, the land the, the land of Egypt uh, through the waters of the Red Sea and rescued them. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, so the mercy seat, and of course that's then the one who, sits on the mercy seat, you know, the Ark of the Covenant is the one, is the same one who uh, was nailed to the wood of the cross uh, yeah. in atonement for the sin of the world. So you could almost translate it as, God, make atonement for me, a sinner. Yes. Yeah, I think you could. Uh, mm-hmm. Because that without the atonement, uh, there is no and can be no forgiveness. Uh, with the atonement, there is forgiveness uh, through the atonement. Um, and, you know, as we maybe a little bit later, um, after we get through these things, maybe we could talk a little bit when we get into, maybe we could talk about a little bit more of the doctrine of justification when we get into maybe a few doctrinal things more so. But I'll save that mm-hmm. for a little bit later, if that's all right. Yeah. Is is there anything in, in that same verse you know, they, they translate it, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But the Greek has the definite article. Is that Im- is that important here? Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't notice that. So God, be merciful to me, uh, the sinner. Is that... Yeah, um, to yeah right. Yeah, right. 
God be merciful to me, the sinner. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it is because it's more specific. It's not just speaking. It's not just a generalized, you know, I'm a sinner among sinners, but here I am, the sinner. Mm-hmm. You know, I stand before you um, as the sinner here in the temple, which is yeah. where they were at. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's almost, so it's almost I as though so. though you know he is aware of the promises that. God makes atonement for sin at the temple. And so he barely, you know, while while he's there, all he can think about is, um, you said that you atone for sin here. I'm the sinner. Um, yeah. yes. Like not the yeah. only one ever, but I'm that one. So you right. said that you atone for sin. I'm the one. <laughs> so that means right. maybe so that you've made atonement for me. Yes, um, so he's right. totally focused on who God is and his relation to him, whereas the Pharisee seems completely oblivious to any of that. He's not focused on the daily sacrifice, and presumably that's when they're in the temple, right? During the daily sacrifices, either morning or evening. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I found it, you know, as I was looking at this um, earlier, I find it interesting that you have there are three things that the Pharisee is doing that Jesus teaches elsewhere are to be done by Christians. Uh, he's praying mm-hmm. and then he references his tithing and he references his fasting. Yeah. Um, three things that Jesus assumes that Christians will do. I mean, in Matthew six, he, he teaches us very clearly, but in doing that, he teaches also how not to be when doing them. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Yeah. When you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. When you do your charitable deeds, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue or in the streets. So there's the warning of how not to be, um, and then the teaching on how to do these things um, in faith. So it's also, I think, then we can look at these things and say, okay, well, what the Pharisee was doing here it, you know, praying is not a bad thing in and of itself. Tithing is not a bad thing. And fasting is not a bad thing. Um, however, when they're done without faith, they mean nothing to the Lord. Uh, mm. They are nothing to him except dirty rags. Um, and there's, it's interesting back earlier in um, both in Luke's gospel and it's also in Matthew. When Jesus is speaking his uh, woes uh, upon the Pharisees, mm-hmm. one of the things that he says, and let um, see if I can, I think I, I had that here. And now, uh, let me see, it's in Luke chapter 11. And so in the midst of speaking his woes, which there are about seven of them, mm-hmm. he says, But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Now, in Matthew's account of that same thing, Matthew also mentions uh, Jesus. uh, This is and that's in Matthew uh, 23. Um, This is verse 20. uh, Let's see. This is verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Hmm. So in other words, you ought to have done the things you were doing, um, you know, tithing and so forth. But because you neglected the weightier matters, justice and mercy and faith, the love of God, so forth, um, you're, you're not right with me. You, you need the weightier matters also. Yeah. And, and you must have these in order for the praying and the tithing and the fasting to mean anything to me. Yeah. So, and so we usually hear, hear that in our ears is we don't need to do the, the praying, the tithing, the fasting, so long as (laughs) we have the weightier matters and, (laughs) Uh, yeah, that's not what right. Jesus is saying. Yeah. <laughs> that's not what he's saying at all. No, he makes very clear, uh, Noel, not just the assumption 
kind of the assumptive language he uses in Matthew 6, but actually um, he commands these things to be done. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, praying, tithing, fasting are actually commanded by our Lord. So we should do them as Christians. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's right. So um, any other translation issues that you ran across? Uh, it's not a huge, I, I, I guess it's maybe just a preference. I, not necessarily, again, that it's a wrong. I, I think the ESV says, I fast twice, to, twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it said. Yeah. Um, King James says, I give tithes of all that I possess. I guess that, I mean, it's just a preference. It's not really a wrong mm -hmm. translation uh, per se. So, but other than that, I didn't really, um, unless you had a couple, anything else, I didn't really notice any, you know, glaring translation issues. No. I mean, just really verse 13 with uh, the be merciful. Um, yeah. It's, it's, certainly not less than mercy, but there's more to unpack there that the preacher would do well to unpack, particularly given the context of, uh, of the parable itself in the temple, um, probably during the, the daily sacrifices and what was going on there. Absolutely. Yeah. The atonement is what gives the mercy the meat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the atonement is the meat of the mercy. Yeah. Uh, the right. Sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, I so, did think, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Well, I was just going to say um, at the beginning of this, I found it interesting that in verse nine, the text says that he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So there is a very, there's a pointedness to this parable as well, that though he, so he's not necessarily speaking it directly to everyone. However, we can't go too far with that because certainly there is a warning in the parable to the Christian, uh, you know, within the parable itself. But he is being very specific here and pointed with who he's going after because he is going after the Pharisee. I mean, he really is. And this is not just, you know, this is not just, um, you know, like it, like it was in, in another spot where I uh, can't remember where that is exactly right now, but the Pharisees perceived that he was speaking a parable against him. Well, here he, <laughs> you know, here he's very pointedly <laughs> speaking a parable against the Pharisee. I mean, it's, it's full, yeah. it's full throttle. Yeah. It's full throttle. But the, but so there, but there's still a warning in there for the Christian as well. Yeah. There's no sense in this case that, that Jesus is a British person. <laughs> 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 where you're talking to some, you know, some Brit and you're like, I don't know, was that a compliment or did he just, did he just insult me? I think he insulted right. me. No, 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 this is really clear. <laughs> yeah, it is abundantly clear. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah. Uh, he's going after the Pharisee because uh, it's, yeah, there's nothing there that, um, that is good in them. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. whitewashed tombs. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So um, we already kind of unpacked the um, the Helaskomai, the Be Merciful. Right. And um, we already kind of looked at a little bit, and maybe, maybe it would behoove the preacher to talk about the daily sacrifices and what happened during those daily sacrifices, perhaps even going, you know, back to Exodus and Leviticus when they're commanded, what the point of those daily offerings were um, to, to, to kind of fill out the context, you know, this is their going to church. Um, yeah. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So given kind of that context, I don't want to get too far ahead, but given that kind of context, what kind of, ideas would be percolating in your mind to approach preaching to a, the congregation who have come up to God's temple, his house, uh, in our midst, uh, to pray, uh, and then to receive the meat of the uh, atoning sacrifice. W what, what sort of things are we trying to get to the hearers who are, who are actually there? 
because it'd be easy to preach against those who aren't there, but who are actually there. Right. What sort of things do we need to keep in mind to address this to them and not, and not just kind of explain this is what's going on? Yeah, I think, uh, good. I think there's a few things because, uh, and one of them is the fact that both the Pharisee and the tax collector were at the temple. They were at church. Okay. So part of the, I guess part of the, one of the things would be a, a warning in the sense that our justification before God does not come simply from being at the temple, simply from going through the motions and simply being there. Uh, there is something that is actually required of us while we are there. And that is the ears of faith. Mm. The ears and eyes of faith are actually required of us so that we do actually receive the meat of the sacrifice, you know, that was, that was given and shed for us on the cross when Jesus did sacrifice himself and atone for the sin of the world so that we, so that we would receive that rightly in humility uh, for our exaltation in the eyes of God, and then um, hear from Jesus as the tax collector did, that you are the one who is able to go back to your house justified, and you are justified, and you are mm -hmm. right with God because you're, 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 the eyes and ears of faith are at work in you. That's the Holy Spirit at work in you, and you are taking heed to the sacrifice that God has sent for you in the person of his son, Jesus. And so he does have mercy on you. He was propitiated for your sake. And um, I think another, I think along with that is, you know, the text lends itself to what we talk about as Lutherans as <clears throat> uh, subjective justification. That is the justification of the individual sinner. And that comes by grace through faith in God, uh, in Jesus Christ. By grace through faith in Jesus Christ, it's a gift of God so that no one can boast mm -hmm. uh, that it's of himself. Um, that only comes to us, however, because of the reality and the truth of the universal objective justification. Uh, namely, that uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, and I read the first John two, uh, verse two, uh, verse earlier, first mm -hmm. John two, two verse about that. He's not only our propitiation, but also for the his propitiation for the whole world. And then of course, you also have John declaring, um, you know, when Jesus appeared on earth, uh, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I think we should have our, our people know that, the, the comfort of our individual justification before God comes from the objective reality of the atonement. Yeah. Because we can't, we couldn't, um, we would not be able to have the comfort that we do and the certainty that we do as individuals unless we had the certainty that he did it for the world. Because... If he didn't do it for the world, then who did he do it for? Maybe he only died for my, you know, maybe he only died for my neighbors across the street. And maybe he didn't die for me. Or maybe he only died for you and not for me or vice yeah, versa. You don't know my neighbors, apparently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but I think you bring up a good point you know, because, um, and I've talked to, to Ramirez about this, uh, and Robert Preuss has talked about this in, in, in his writings that you that there's nothing in the Bible that says, um, you know that uh, that God sent His Son to die for Mike Grevy, um, right, or for Jason Broughton. It says that He sent His Son to die for the world, and so by logical inference, I'm part of the world, so He's died for me. And so th you right. get this in the yeah. Catechism, don't you? You get this, you know, that God created all things. But we always say he created me and all creatures, that he gave me, or that um, that Jesus Christ is my Lord, who redeemed me, who sanctified me. So it always becomes that objective reality, 
must be grasped hold uh, by faith and appropriated to oneself. And so it's almost as though what's happening here is um, you you don't have the proper orientation, right? The, the Pharisee is not facing the altar, if you will, right? He's facing the crowds to look around how he's better. Whereas the only orientation that the tax collector has is toward the altar. And he's seeing the general promise and thus by logical inference is by faith in that general promise appropriated to himself. Be, you know, atone, for, make atonement for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's well said. Uh, because that is how he has the confidence that he does. The fact that he knows that that this was done for the world. And so you go from the greater to the lesser, right? The greater reality or the objective reality, I guess we'd say, that it's done for the world uh, by inference, as you say, also means that it was done for me. So mm-hmm. I'm the sinner here, right? God be yeah. merciful to me, the sinner. And um, so, and this is why, you know, too, I, I just, um, uh, the the comfort, the universal objective justification is not uh, universalism, as sometimes uh, I've heard that accusation leveled in some mm-hmm. other Lutheran circles. I, mm-hmm. um, you know, I just, I, I just read a book not too long ago, um, and it was written by a pastor. He's talking about translations and. Um, things like that and, and errors in translation. And he does make some good points about, you know, um, for example, in Isaiah, he talks about one place where um, it, the modern translators have translated it as young woman instead of virgin and how that, and that is, that's a bad translation. It's a wrong translation because if she's just because she's a young woman doesn't mean that she would be a virgin, but the, the word is virgin. That's the, that's mm-hmm. the word in Hebrew. Um, so, but the universal objective justification uh, cannot be conflated with universalism. They're not the same thing. Universalism is the teaching that everybody in the end is going to be saved anyway, whether they have faith or not, because Jesus is the Savior and everybody's going to be in eternal life. Um, and what that does, that universalism robs Christ of the of his honor, and it... It takes away um, the, from the objective reality too, because mm-hmm. um, again, if he if he did it for if he didn't do it for the world, how do I know he did it for me? But the, because he did it for the world, we can have the confidence that he did it for me and for you. And so that's where the the subjective, the individual part comes into play and comes into the clearness. Then clarity is through universal objective justification. So and. It's, I mean, it's clear from the scriptures and our confessions teach it very clearly as well that you need, that you really do need both. You really have to have both. And that's what the tax collector is really laying hold of here. He's laying hold of the reality that, that God is his propitiation Mm -hmm. and the sacrifice is, has been made or is being made for him. Uh, And that's the, that's, as you say, that's the, the for me part. Mm -hmm. Um, and because, and I think it's Walther who, and I, and I think, and Walther was right to say this. I think Walther called Christ's death on the cross the an absolution of the whole world, and he's and he's right to do that. Uh, I would argue because the the absolution is true whether it's believed or not, but it's the it's the faith in it that receives the benefit of it the blessing of it. And this is no different than what we teach regarding the supper of our Lord too, that even those who eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus without faith are eating and drinking the body and blood of Jesus, Mm -hmm. but they're drinking it to their judgment and they're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. They're not drinking it for their forgiveness of sins. And so uh, we can say the same thing, even in individual or private confession and absolution that uh, as well as in the general corporate, that the absolution is given and the absolution is valid. But if it's not believed by the individual sinner, then the individual sinner doesn't have the benefit of it, doesn't mm-hmm. have the 
doesn't receive the forgiveness there actually. So, and so the Pharisee, then how do we look at this with the Pharisee then? Well, the Pharisee actually then is, what is he really denying? He's really denying that Jesus is the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. that, that is really what he is denying. And because he's denying that, he can't have, or he doesn't have, uh, he doesn't have faith then because he's denying that Jesus actually is the sacrifice uh, sent by God uh, and that and that Jesus, so Jesus did because Jesus died for the world. He did also die for the Pharisee, but the Pharisee is not benefiting from it. He's not benefiting mm -hmm. from it because he's trusting in himself uh, and despising others at, at the same time. So in preaching, you're going to want to highlight then what the necessity or um, the benefits that faith give or how faith grasps hold of this? I think so. Yeah. I think we're going to highlight, um, it's good to highlight that Jesus is the one sacrifice for the sin of the world, that objective reality, and that our faith receives that benefit and grasps hold of it. And that's how we can go home justified. We can go back to our houses justified, every single one of us. Um, and, that this is actually to when we and, and when we confess our sins, like the tax collector did, we are actually seeing ourselves rightly. That's what humility really looks like. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a self degradation, like we mentioned earlier, but it's seeing oneself rightly in relation to God and in His eyes, mm -hmm. um, because then He looks back at us through his son, Jesus, who is the sacrifice. And that's how he's pleased with us because, you know, as Paul says that Jesus is the one mediator between God and men. Yeah. So he's the propitiation, he's the sacrifice. And so um, we look to him uh, rather than, you know, as you mentioned earlier, the Pharisee was kind of, he was looking at everyone else and using really the measurements that the world uses, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the, the thing I think, you know, and you can see that in his prayer. Uh, we haven't talked too much about that part yet, but God, I thank you that I am not like other men, you know, well, that's, I mean, right off the, before he gets into specifics, <laughs> I mean, right off the bat, it's bad prayer to start with, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm not, thank God I'm not like other men. I'm not a, an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. And I'm certainly not like this guy over here. Certainly yeah. not like this tax collector who's over here. I mean, tax collectors were already, as we know, they're, they're not looked down. They're not looked upon highly at all anyway. Yeah. Uh, even now. Pretty much. Even now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> even now, maybe especially now. Uh but so throughout the history, really, of tax collecting, uh, they have not been, uh, they've pretty much been, have been despised. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that maybe this is, you know, uh, Jesus puts that in there. I mean, this, this guy is a tax collector, so that he's not just some guy, you know, he specifically is a tax collector. And I think that this kind of is, another way that Jesus is kind of, he is rubbing the Pharisees nose in it because here Jesus is and here he's justifying the tax collector, right? Mm -hmm. He's justifying the tax collector over the Pharisee. And this is how then you have this, 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 uh, juxt or this switching, right? The Pharisee who is exalting himself is put down by Jesus through Jesus exalting the tax collector. So Jesus is exalting the tax collector far above the Pharisee here. Mm -hmm. And um, so the Pharisee is humbled by Jesus. And the tax collector, who was already humble because he, he made the good confession, is exalted uh, by Jesus. And so you have a, a switching of places, so to speak, from the way that the world looks at things and the way yeah. that the Pharisee looks at things. So it's really, yeah, it's really stark and it's really, mm -hmm. uh, it's really, it's quite an abrupt parable. Um, but it should be, uh, 
really it should be for the utmost comfort for our people who um, who need mercy and who recognize that they need it. Yeah, it, it seems as though this is a, a theme already brought up in the beginning of Luke's gospel with the Magnificat, right? that he brings down the mighty from their thrones and he exalts those of humble estate. Um, you know, he he sends the rich empty away and he fills the hungry with good things. Um, yeah. So, so this is definitely a an ongoing theme or a, a theme throughout Luke's gospel of the exaltation yeah. of the humble and the humbling of the exalted, the leveling of the 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 peaks and the bringing up of the valleys. Um, not as a flattening of things, but as a reversal. Yes, yeah, a reversal. And you and you even have this kind of, I mean, as you look um, at the rest of, I mean, this is kind of going ahead, but it still fits in the context in Luke's gospel in chapter 18, as you go, as you continue through that chapter, you have, you know, after this, um, parents bringing their infants to Jesus so that he can touch them. And the disciples are rebuking the parents for bringing their infants to Jesus. And Jesus mm -hmm. isn't happy about it. <laughs> right. And he's telling them that, you know, the kingdom of God needs to be received in the manner that a little child receives things. Yeah. And that means as a gift and in no other way, uh, as, a, as an act of my mercy mm -hmm. and in no other way than that. And then you have the same kind of a thing in uh, the, uh, you know, he humbles the rich young ruler right after that, who comes mm -hmm. and asks him, you know, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And it's kind of a, it's a, it's, it's an interesting question because uh, he's got, he, he seems to know that there's an inheritance here, but he, he knows that there's an inheritance, but how to go about it, he's got all wrong, you see, because he, so it's, um, you know, he lacks the one thing that he lacks is faith because mm -hmm. Jesus tells him, you know, the, the second table of the law. And then the rich young ruler says, I've done all those things. Well, you lack one thing and that is following me. That's what you lack. You need to follow me. And mm -hmm. the only way you follow me is by faith through faith. Yeah. Um, so it kind of continues along that line. Even after this, again, it's about, you know, it continues to be about humility and uh, seeing ourselves rightly in the eyes of God. Yeah. And I, so just thinking out loud here, you know, <clears throat> I know that we, as, you know, 21st century Americans, we like the, we like the, the stories that have this kind of reversal, you know, where the downtrodden, uh, you know, make mm -hmm. it, you know, the, 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 the stories of, you know, those who begin it, with humble beginnings from humble means finally make it. Um, right. But we also are very attuned to dislike things that seem unequal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is not like, yeah. uh, and yeah. I think as we were mentioned before, this is not a leveling. They don't, he doesn't make, he doesn't make the Pharisee and the tax collector equal. He no, no, lowers no. he he lowers the Pharisee and he no. exalts, so they trade places. Um, and this is not a comedy in 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 our sense of the word comedy, right? Um oh, right. in you know the the classical sense of the word comedy, I suppose it is. But this isn't like Eddie Murphy trading places. This is <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. This is, um, he's exalting those who are properly oriented and see themselves um, kind of in the in the proper hierarchy of things, and so so it's a it's it's a reorienting and it's putting things into their proper places, and uh, I wonder. I wonder yeah. if we need to explore that in preaching this particular text, considering kind of uh, our, 
our day and age with a focus on equality, egalitarianism, um, all of those sorts of things, that we're not the ones who create the hierarchies. We're not the ones who create the orders in the universe that the part of being properly oriented is seeing where you fit into your proper place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, so you've got, uh, there's a few thing, a couple things there. The, it's one thing for us to talk about inequality in the order of redemption, um, where Paul, for example, talks about everyone who is in Christ Jesus being a son of God, whether yeah. they're male or female, slave or free, you know, Jew or Gentile, right? Because you're every, anyone who is baptized into Christ is a son of God. So it's one thing for him to do that. That's the order of redemption. And that's one thing. But in the order of creation, there is a multitude of inequality and there and there and it's purposeful. It's intentional. Mm -hmm. The 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 inequality is actually embedded in the creation by God. It's baked in. It's part of the design. It, it's part of the design. Right. Um, it, it is not um, uh, in the orders of creation. Male and female are not equal. Uh, there is a complementarity there, but there is also a hierarchy there, as we see in the scripture very yeah. clearly. There's a hierarchy. Um, you know, uh, after the fall, God says, you know, to the woman, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Right. And, and that desire that she had that, that he's talking about that she will have is to replace him, to take his place mm -hmm. as the ruler. And God says, no, that shall not be the case. Mm -hmm. Uh and then he is also to, as Paul puts it, he's the head of the wife. Mm -hmm. um, and he is to love her as Christ loved the church uh, and gave himself for her. So there's an inequality there. That's just, those are just a couple of examples. But there's plenty of others too. I mean, you, we, and you mentioned egalitarianism, and that's a huge problem. Um, and so it, it, there is going to be in this creation, there's always going to be, always going to be an equality in that regard. And we need to, we, we need to, I think we actually need to embrace that and we need to love it because God has made it that way. This is what mm -hmm. he has ordained. Yeah. So we need to love what God has ordained and not uh, be so quick to try to either explain it away or, uh, apologize for it. Yeah. And that's we, we need to stop apologizing for what God has ordained. <laughs> well, yeah, you know? I, it, it always seems like it would be kind of nice to do the you know the old um, used car salesman gambit. You know, you go to buy a car. Maybe it's not just used car salesman. I think it's new car salesman too. That you know they, they get you um, to do things you don't want to by getting you to say yes to things at first. Uh, that's a, it's a, it's a pretty car, isn't it? Yes. It's a, you know, it, it looks real sleek, doesn't it? Yeah. Blah. You know, all of these where you're saying yes. And like, oh, how about we take it for a dress uh, test drive? And you're already saying yes. And so you say, you know, you're kind of manipulated by this. It almost be kind of neat to, right. to try to, you know, run that gambit in a sermon in, in this sort of way. Um, where you, you know, you get them agreeing, you know, that the Pharisee's bad, you know, cause he's not, cause he's not humbling himself. He's not orienting himself correctly to who God is and under his word. And then you'd say, and you guys wouldn't do that. And then you start reading these passages that say, submit to your husbands or, uh, right. to yeah. see what their reaction is, um, all the passage, or just find all the passages that make us kind of, uh, as 21st century Americans initially kind of bristle at to read those aloud and just let them sit there to see yeah. kind of as in a mirror, look, you do the same thing only under different circumstances. Right. Yeah. Like, With, like little, yeah, like yeah. to say, you know, it's shameful for a woman to not have her head uncovered. In church, <laughs> right? Just read that yeah. out loud in the middle of the yeah, day. Your sermon, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's true. It, it's more. It happens 
it happens in more subtle ways with us. Yes. But it's nonetheless devious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, and, uh, and well, it's, it's satanic. Pretty, it's satanic. Yeah. It's pervasive. Yeah. It becomes, and so it's, it's the, uh, you know, we've compromised with the culture and the milieu of the day, we, you know, the, the narrative of the day, and we just don't. And so you're right. We bristle or we're uncomfortable with certain passages of scripture that point out those things that we actually do mm -hmm. <laughs> that are in their own way, a form of self exaltation then. Yeah. Uh, so we may not be, so I think that's part of the warning here. I think that could be included with part of the warning of this is that we don't know. Okay. None of, so strictly speaking, are any of us who belong to Christ who are Christians, are we strictly speaking Pharisees? Well, no, strictly speaking, we're not, but, and there is a, but, and you know, we, we can be, um, we still can be Pharisaical or, uh, we can be, um, you know, like you, like you mentioned in subtle ways doing the things, you know, we, we would say, well, thank God we're not like the Pharisee and the, we're, we're, we're obviously not like him. Yeah. You know, you can kind of flip it around in a sense and say, well, I'm glad, like, you, you know, I'm glad I'm not like the Pharisee. Yeah. And then you read these other passages that expose <laughs> the fact that, well, we might not be a Pharisee, but oh gosh, um, we still got these sins here and we still got these things that are not good and they're not pleasing to God. And they kind of fall along the lines of, I guess, we, we, maybe we could say the, I don't know, the, it's, it's, it is third use of the law stuff. You know, it's yeah. instruction, God's instruction for our lives as Christians, how mm -hmm. we should look and how we should live, that we actually should look different from the world. It is actually true that we should not sound the same as the world and we shouldn't actually look the same as the world. And... I think another part, I think another thing that plays into this, and I, I've thought about this sometimes when we, we sometimes that the self degradation that I was mentioning earlier can sometimes come in the form of, uh, us saying things like, well, I'm a no good, dirty, rotten sinner, even after we've been absolved mm. and justified. And it's like, we're returning to, it's like, well, no, you should, now you should see that we should actually see that God has made Christians different from other people. Mm -hmm. He actually has. And there is actually a difference. And this is why I think we, sometimes we, I think we underplay the fact that we're saints. We overplay mm -hmm. that we're sinners. We underplay that we're saints. And so what should saints look like? How should yeah. saints live? Well, here's a list of, you know, 75 Bible passages, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, well, and probably well, more. I mean, yeah, it's, certainly, it's almost but, like you know. we're a um, embodiment of, you know, Romans 1 and 2, <laughs> where, oh, you, yeah, yeah, where we're, you know, it, we say we're sinners so that we can keep doing the things that we like instead of uh, fighting against the things that we know we should fight against. So we, uh, we approve of, uh, of certain things in order to, so we approve that we're a sinner so that we can keep being that. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's kind of a, and that ends up being, you know, kind of the Romans six problem then, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may Yeah, happen? exactly. Well, certainly not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, how should we have died to sin live any longer? You know? <laughs> right. uh, so it, yeah, it's, it, and it does it. We, and we've got kind of this strange, I, I I guess to me, it's a, we, over the past, I guess, several years, I've come to realize that we've got this strange fear of living a holy life. Yeah. And it's just, it's kind of odd in a way, but it's just, it's there. We've got the strange fear of being a saint and, and living like a saint. Yeah. Um, because we like to return to that, you know, well, I'm, I'm a no good, dirty, rotten sinner. And as if somehow we think that that's, and I think that that does then, there's some false humility there then. I think what that ends up being, there's some false humility built in and baked into that. Well, um, yeah, 
and we don't believe uh, i mean on top of that we we don't believe that the the life of holiness and righteousness that is laid out before us in the scriptures is appealing or good yeah so appealing or good yeah and because, maybe even attainable because oftentimes <laughs> yeah yeah well but you know, Often, oftentimes, we will highlight the "yeah, we're all sinners" type thing in order to make an appeal to the world, instead of letting how we are different oh, yeah. be the appeal to the world. Yes, yes, right. The goodness yes, of yes. of who God has made us to be be the appeal to the world. The fact that we are able to rejoice in suffering, the fact that we are able to laugh in the face of um, of death and destruction and cry that we have those things that make us different. And yet our appeal is to what they already know. They know that they don't do what's right before God. Instead, we should let the difference between the sons of light and the sons of this world be the thing that be the thing that calls them to it. Yes. Yeah. Look what you could have. Right. Yeah. What, what if you're missing out on, and what yeah. if, yeah, what if you were different than what you are now? Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> you know, instead yeah. of yeah, instead of kind of playing to the samenesses, uh, play to the differences, and yeah. and focus on how to the higher flare, things, <laughs> to the higher things, yeah, to the higher things uh, that the Christian has, and and the fact that then that goes back to you know. That kind of goes back right back to the parable that um, God has exalted us mm -hmm. and he's given us these great treasures and um, uh, he expects us to believe them and he also expects us to live according to them and to trust and and to trust that the Holy Spirit will actually do what God's word says he'll do yeah in our lives and he will actually bless it too he'll bless he'll bless the, the marriages that are lived the way God intends for them to be lived. He'll bless the families where the fathers and mothers, you know, raise their children in the training and admonition of the Lord and the, and the sons and daughters honor and obey their parents. Mm -hmm. um, and he'll, he'll bless these things tremendously. Um, you know, if we, if we, if we just, if we but trust that he will actually do it and actually then make it our aim uh, with zeal to live according to that holy life and yeah. yeah and then be be those you know and then and then appeal and then our appeal to the world becomes something that really is different rather than something that's uh sadly in many places you know many times looks too much like the world yeah yeah uh, any final thoughts about uh, <clears throat> looking at preaching this? Um, I think, you know, just to um, one thing that, could, that the pastor could do in preaching also is to commend to our people praying, prayer, fasting and tithing. You know, mm -hmm. we just had the parable of the unjust steward a couple of weeks ago, and that, and that certainly fits in with tithing. And um, the benefits of these things to not just our souls, but to our bodies uh, particularly in, you know, you and I, I think you were in the, we just had uh, not too long ago, the Bugenhagen conference, and uh, there was a sectional done uh, on fasting. Mm -hmm. And um, you, it really is, you know, the, the benefits of fasting are many, they really mm -hmm. are. And we should uh, be willing to take those up a little bit more than we do uh, for the benefit of our, of our bodies and our souls. We kind of, you know, I think it was um, in one of the other podcasts you, when you've had on uh, uh, Peterson, I think one of the things that I remember him saying is that we train the body in order to train the soul. And he, mm -hmm. it wasn't his original thing. He got it from somewhere else. But the point being that um, we do need to train our bodies um, and, you know, get them fit and so forth. So I think we could, in our preaching, I think we can commend and I think a reminder would be good to our people that Jesus is not saying that praying, tithing, and fasting are bad because the Pharisee was doing those things. Right. But then, 
bring those guilt things. by association. Yeah, exactly. But then bring those things into the proper place and the proper perspective for Christians and say, no, these things are good, uh, but they're good when we do them as we're trusting Jesus. We need to yeah. trust him first in order to do these things well, and then mm -hmm. we can do these things well. And so I think that's something that could be brought out that might be helpful to our people too, lest they think, right, that these things, that Jesus was not happy with the things themselves, and it, that wasn't it at all, so. Well, excellent. Thank you for your time, Mike, and uh, I look forward to having you on again, man. Hey, thanks. It's been great. Enjoyed it very much. We'll talk to you later.